All right, today I'm here with Sherry at uh, Unita's headquarters where all their abrasives are manufactured and she is the hand sanding expert. So we're gonna be talking about the pad saver. I was just going over with you, you know, some tips and tricks when it comes to sanding and I found out that I haven't been using one of these things and I really should be using one of these things all the time. It comes with a kit. You can buy um, the kit from Paint Life Supply Co. or you can buy it from Unita's website. And it's a kit that includes a sander, a bag, and a lot of uh, other abrasives. It includes this little device right here too. Sherry, can you talk a little bit about this pad saver, why it's so important? Yeah, this pad saver is what keeps you from swirling your wood. So anytime you're running a sheet good, which is a conventional abrasive sheet, we always have to put the pad saver in between. And the reason being, Chris, is that if you don't have this pad saver, what happens is the center panel will start to vibrate and it'll catch the sander and the sander will skip across the surface causing swirl marks. So when you put the pad saver on, it actually absorbs some of that and it allows it to move smoother. Unfortunately, because of the sander, you're still going to see a few swirl marks, but it's going to lessen this a lot. The other thing that the pad saver does is it saves your backup pad because pulling this on and off, as you can see, every time you pull this on and off, it stretches out the hooks. Not only that, we generate heat, so the hooks will eventually straighten out, right? And that becomes a problem. So the pad saver will actually prolong the life of your backup pad, mm -hmm. the hooks and you'll just be replacing the pad saver versus the pad pad. So it's interesting because when you told me that, I instantly related to what you were talking about when it comes to the sander walking. This is what I typically did. I would always tell somebody that didn't know how to use my sander, if it was an employee or something, you always got to put a pad saver on so you don't damage this, which um, is probably good practice. Yeah, that's good practice. But when I was using it myself, I would always just put the film tech on. But a lot of times when I'd start sanding, I would get vibration mm -hmm. and the sander would start off walking as soon as I you know, pressed uh, the on button and started sanding. So you're now telling me this will eliminate a lot of that. Very much so. One of the things, the questions I would have for you is, is this going to hinder um, us from getting no. a really flat finish? No. No. No, because there's no, it's going to act as a, a shock absorber to absorb the vibration, but it's still stiff enough that you're going to be able to apply the pressure that you need and it's not going to give you any give on the abrasive. That's the one thing that, you know, you can, when you look at pad savers versus interface pads, the interface pad is to give you that little bit of give of the abrasive, to allow that abrasive to kind of recede. Well, with this, it's going to stay prominent. And that's what we want when we're trying to flatten out something like that. We want that, prom that, that abrasive grain to stay prominent and stay focused on the wood. And this will not change that. All right. So now just to um, summarize uh, this, Sherry. So we've got our pad saver and anytime I'm using film tech with which is a plastic abrasive I use it all the time I definitely always want to use a pad saver absolutely okay so if I know some people are using paper abrasives um, this is a flat paper abrasive um, called um, Storm. so do I want to use the pad saver when yes. I'm yeah, Echostorm too yes now that's some really good information so I've run into that this problem and now I think I'm gonna um, have a little more success with my sanding, um, not have swirls probably in the future using this. Uh, now, I want to get it right. This is a pad saver. Is it right. a pad saver? Pad okay. saver. It comes with an interface pad. I usually don't use the interface pad. This is a paper abrasive, so I'm going to want to use yeah. an interface pad with this also. Pad saver. Right. Pad saver. Did I say interface yes. pad again? That's quite a bit. <laughs> I want to always use an interface pad. This thing is very important. If you don't have an interface pad, if you haven't bought the kit, um, you're going to find out today. So it is a pad saver. Pad saver. Not an interface pad. Pad saver. Good job. Well, I was going to just roll with it because it doesn't matter. Everybody calls it an interface pad. It doesn't matter. Okay. I saw you like, I was like, it must be important. <laughs> you should just, I mean, you I heard just go. I've once and then three Cut. times. All right, maybe three times is too much. Yeah, that's not. <laughs> I run into swirls, it's been a challenge, and I learned now that there's a product how to get rid of swirls. So, Sherry, can you talk about um, these products here and give us a little information on how we can use those things with our 3x4 sander? Yeah, Chris, these are both non-woven pads. They have hook and loop backing. Um, they only work on swirls in the 3x4 size. So don't do it with a 5-inch random orbital because you're going to cause more swirls. They do have abrasive grain in them. You've got a 320 grit aluminum oxide and you've got a 600 grit silicon carbide. 
The only reason I use the 320 grit is if I've got a someone that has really swirled something up with a five inch and we've got some major pigtails going on. I need something a little bit more aggressive, right? So then we'll use the maroon. Day to day, I use the gray. This is where if someone has used the three by four in the center panel and it's caught and it's swirled up a little bit, we can actually use the gray over it on the raw wood and it'll eliminate it, mask the swirls. So it really knocks the tops off of them so that you don't see them in stain. Right. right. That's interesting. So now I've learned something completely new because I know there was one cabinet job I ran into and I think I know now why I got the swirls because I wasn't using a pad saver to begin with. I was using just um, sponges to sand in between coat or I, I think I might have even used film tech which was causing me to get some walking and get some swirls and I was trying to eliminate the swirls with sponges like super fine sponges but that's probably not the best thing to do, right? No, and, and another thing, that another big reason why you would get swirls with foam would be using the wrong thickness or the wrong density of uh, sponge. The half inch sponge has been uh, sold from the very beginning. It was really the first one that came out in the US, right? And so it was sold at, at trade shows. And the neat thing was, is that you would see it on the sander and you'd see it on profiles. So everybody got all excited because you could get into the profiles and the flutes on the profiles, right? right? And so everybody was all excited about it and they bought it and they bought the kit and they got the half inch out and they immediately went to sand and they would sand it on flats. And what ends up happening when we sand on flats with the half inch is that this abrasive grain recedes into the sponge. Right. So you're having, you're, you have the weight of the sander on that sponge and as you're sanding, again, direct drive system, it's spinning and it's causing it to catch and twist. And that's gonna cause you swirl marks and cause you a lot of problems. So it's kind of like fighting myself using the wrong abrasive right. for the wrong thing. So um, so this is really good information to know. So we now have these, um, are they called woven or non-woven? Non-woven, non-woven. So, which is really interesting to me because I look at that and I see it's like a woven material, but what is the non-woven actually referencing? It's nylon fibers, and if you've ever seen it made, um, you would understand it's it it starts super thick, right. right? And they depending on how the the fibers are laying, they'll spray grain and then they'll spray their resins, and then it goes through a bed and it's got millions of needles, and it just needles it down into each other. So there's nothing actually tying any of this together. It's ah. just very separate. So all of this okay. just kind of, kind of, you know, you'll start to see it fray after usage right. for a while, but that's due to not having anything tying right. it together. It's just needled down inside itself. So that's pretty cool, interesting, um, you know, fact or information about that that I didn't know. So um, we talked about the importance of the pad saver that we should be using that with conventional abrasives. Now, if I'm using that non-woven, non-woven, did I say that right? Non-woven, non-woven pad to eliminate swirls, do I use the pad saver? No, the only time we use a pad saver is with con what we call conventional abrasives. That's, you know, sanding this or sanding pads such as these, either be film or paper sheets. Okay. So that's some good information. Now, um, we've talked about you know how to get uh, rid of swirls using these non-woven pads. And I guess um, another thing that you know just came up to me, you know, because I noticed you know there's holes in all these things for vacuuming and um in, in all the abrasives that we see right here. When I'm using the um, non-woven pad, is it gonna be vacuuming or am yes. I gonna be creating dust? So it's gonna be vacuuming no, right through. It's gonna that. it's gonna vacuum right through here. Okay. It's, it's pretty um, open, open, and so it, it pulls through. Right. We do uh, uh, punch holes in this if you need it. If right. you see that you, you are generating too much dust, we do have these available with holes. I don't run the holes just simply because I feel like I get enough suction with it. Right. There is another product that comes in Unita's kit that um, is sold on Paint Life Supply Co. that um, you may, if you buy the kit, you may not know what the heck these are for. They're called interface pads. Um, look a little bit unusual. We're gonna talk about the interface pad and their importance and why you should be using them because they do serve a purpose and there's some times that you should be using them. There's a open cell one and a closed cell one, Sherry. So can you just talk to um, our viewers that might be interested in getting that perfect finish and what they could use these things for? Well, 
Mostly these are used with, of course, all the time. Sorry, not mostly, but all the time with our sheet goods. And the reason we have these is because the foam is great. When you're talking in the finish room on prime or anything like that, it, it is the best, the speediest way to, to sand between coats. But a lot of times we'll get into areas where there may be, you need a little bit more aggressive. Um, I know with conversion varnish, that had been a problem with us in the past. Um, uh, just some rougher surfaces. And when we get into that, we can't always use the foam because it doesn't flatten it out. And that's the big thing is that if you've got a rough finish, it doesn't matter if you sand it, if it's still rough, when you put your next coat, you're gonna still see that roughness. So the interface pads gives us ability to, to replicate the foam, but with a conventional abrasive. So this is the softer version. This is the, uh, the soft um, 10 millimeter. And it'll actually, if you need to get down, you can see this pillow top. We don't want a flat spot, but we can actually wrap into that pillow top, right? We have to be careful though, because again, while that doesn't level, this does. So you kind of, you gotta keep yourself off of the edge work, right? This probably isn't the best profile because it's a little tight for this, but it kind of gives us an idea of what. The other profile that we can use is the, which is missing now. Hand me that. This is just that cut. Yeah. This is the, a better profile to show it on. If I want to sand this with the sander, I can take this and I can actually use it to go all the way up into this, right? right? If I need it to be a little stiffer, so this profile is a little bit shorter, I want it to be a little stiffer, I'll take a sheet good And I've got a little bit more um, push into it the way I can actually get down into right. this deep profile, right? The other thing that I tell people all the time is, and, and this is not so much with the, not just with the interface pads, with, but with the sponge, don't be afraid to use that offset. I do that a lot. Yeah. Use that offset yeah. because that offset will allow you to get in here really good and close. Because right. getting down deep in here is hard. Yeah. Without doing it by hand. So, so my question would be with um, the interface pads, do you need the interface pad if you have half inch sponges? And what, or if you do, what's the difference between using this and this combination? Well, there's a lot of times that this will not flatten out a rough finish, right? It won't, okay. Right. The other thing is, is this, if this was raw wood, right? Right. If you have knife marks all the way down right. your molding. Yeah, I've seen that lots okay. of times. Cannot get it out with, even with a, going to a coarse, Right. half inch sponge because that grain recedes. I need that grain to stay more prominent, but I need a little give. So I'll go right. to the half inch interface pad and then that way I can get in and I can take out those knife marks or the mold yeah. molding marks, the molder marks that you see. So if I want to get a flat finish on a contoured surface, um, I'm not gonna get a flat finish on a contoured surface with this because the grain's gonna recede, but on that, I could get a yeah. flat finish on this slide, so that makes a whole lot of sense yeah. to me now. Agastorm is yellow, Film Tech is blue. So we've got Sherry, she is the master at hand sanding. Can you talk to us a little bit about you know what these two are and when maybe I would use either or? The Echostorm is a paper abrasive. It's also got a rolled on sterate, so it prevents it from loading, right? But once the sterate's gone, then you know it, it, you no longer have that protection. With film tech, it's a film plastic film abrasive, right? And it doesn't tear. It also has the, the sterate in the resins. So when you're sanding, it continues to dissipate the dust away from it. The nice thing about film is that if I get in the corner, right, and I bump in, I can actually get all the way to the corner because it won't lose grain on the corner and it won't tear, where paper will actually tear and you'll start to see the grain shed. Right. So I, I know, like, I've talked about it um, a while, you know, back, and um, some people ask me, I've always said that um, Eka Storm, which is the yellow, which is the paper, it actually cuts better. Now, am I wrong or am I right? Am no, I you're actually right. The Eka Storm is a little bit more aggressive. The initial cut rate and when you first start sanding is very, it's very aggressive and it goes really fast. 
especially in the coarser grits. And when you get a little bit finer grits, it starts to slow down and gets a little bit more even. But in the coarser grits and you're like 120s, 80s, 120s, even the 150, you get a very uh, advanced cut with the Echo Storm. I like the Echo Storm in the heavier grits. I do. It's a very good product. So, because I used to tell people, um, used to, and I still do, but I want to make sure I get this right. If you're like stripping a finish, so if I've got this door right here and I want to strip the finish off, um, even down to maybe bare wood, um, maybe Echo Storm be better than Film Tech for that? It's it's a little bit cheaper. Right. And it's a lot a little bit better cut. And so because in, we have a tendency to not use a disc all the way to the end, especially when we're stripping stuff down, once it stops cutting, we're ripping it off looking for the next one. So the Echo Storm gives you a better economical uh, option, and it also gives you a little bit better cut rate. So it's going to initially take off more product than what the Film Tech will initially. Yeah. I know there, and you brought it up, there is a cost difference, but to me the cost difference is not that much of, of a cost difference. I know film tech all around performs very well for me yes. all around. So when it comes to the film tech, typically on an average size job, I'm only going through about five of these anyway. So we're talking just pennies and I don't like to make it too complicated and have too many abrasives you know, in my arsenal. So um, is that wrong or am I right by doing that? No, and I think that you know, with film tech, because it is film, it's flatter. And when you're refinishing a job and you're not going into those aggressive you're not stripping it down you're not going into those aggressive grits the film tech is great and like you said the pricing is not that different film tech has been fabulous for us because it is a film back abrasive at a paper price and that's been a, a great advantage for us now if you're actually going to have to strip the wood back I think that you're going to get a little bit more cut out of that right. and you'll get you know a little bit longer life and I, and I, I want to touch on this just really quickly too, because when I first got into using abrasives like five years ago, it really just kind of revolutionized and changed how I did things in cabinet painting. A lot of the terminology was new to me and just like right over my head. And, and I started hearing the word steration. I'm like, what the heck is that? You brought that up. And can you just touch on, you kind of touched on it, this, this, if you look at it, it's yellow. And if we look at it like really closely in the camera, it's like yellow and gray. And what is steration and what does it actually do? Steration is added into the abrasive, right? And, in, and you can do it in a multiple different ways. One way is to do what we do here with Film Tech is to apply the steration into this, the resin and then apply it to the abrasive and then when it's sprayed on. With this one, this is called a rolled on sterate. So it's actually, the sterate is on a roller and it's actually coated on after the um, abrasive, but before the resins and stuff. So it's actually on there with the resins, but it wears off much quicker because it's right. applied after the resin. So. And so one of the things I learned was that's, you know, why Unita's abrasives are so much more effective, sometimes cost a little bit more than what you can buy at your local hardware store is the process that goes to manufacturing this abrasive. And typically you're not gonna see steration in a lot of these lower end abrasives. Right. And so they're not gonna be as effective. They're gonna load up a lot more. And that's, is that kind of correct? It is and it is. Um, it's cheaper to do a rolled on sterate than it is to do a sterate in the resins, right? Mm -hmm. So if you see um, a product with a rolled on sterate, it's usually on the, the, the lower end. And depending on the grain, you know, it, uh, abrasives is, a, is an evolving thing. And when I talk to people about abrasives and the different grains and why we use this or why we use that, that's kind of the steration goes into that. And even though this is a rolled on sterate and it's a less expensive product, it's still a really good product because we use a premium grain. Right. at Ekamont. So they yeah. that that's a very uh, huge point, you know, when you're looking at abrasives is to make sure that where you're getting it from, what kind of steration and what you want to do with your substrate. Right. Previously, we introduced and talked of just briefly about the Eka Diamond Sponge. This is something that is very new to the industry. Um, I believe that you guys have the exclusive rights to it here in yes. the United States and maybe even North America. And it's a unique sponge. So I think you need to stay tuned and listen to what this thing is all about because you're going to show us what it actually is about, Sherry. What we try to do in the finish room is we try to eliminate hand sanding. And we can do about 90% of, uh, with uh, 
the uh, yeah. XL Plus and the 3 by 4 and yeah. Ender. But we still get into areas where we have to have a hand sponge. One of the problems in the past has been either, you know, you have the, hands, the half inch hand sponge that would, when you would come around the corner, it tears. Or you had to be careful because if it was the black or the brown, it would leave the grain in the white paint. Right. So they introduced the white, but we're still having grain in the paint. You can still feel it if you run your hand over it and that's still gotta be flattened down on your next coat, right? With the Echo Diamond, we've eliminated that. Okay, so we got almost zero shedding. We've got the ability to come around a corner without tearing. And the other thing is, this one does not load. I have customers that swear by this. When we introduced it about a year ago, um, it was slow to take off. You know, people were kind of like hesitant, just like when you started with the, the first uh, sponges for the sander. Mm -hmm. But once they got their hands on it and they started using it and they could see the longevity of this thing, it's crazy how fast it has taken off. And so, I mean, longevity just ends up meaning you're just gonna spend less money on your abrasive, so your overhead is gonna be lower. So. It does have a diamond pattern on it. You can see that diamond pattern. And um, is that something unique? Does it serve a purpose? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it does actually serve a pr purpose because it's got channels. So it's, again, it's allowing us to give us some room for the, the dust to dissipate, right? right? And the nice thing, other thing, nice thing about this thing is it comes in a very variation of colors by grit. Right. So if you're looking for something a little bit coarser, you're gonna go with 100 grit. We also do a 120, uh, 150, 180, 220, and it's easy in the shop for them to know which grit to right. grab, right? So once you learn the color code, you know exactly what grit you're grabbing right. then is what I understand. So I know like you talked a little bit about shedding. So we've got, you know, the, um, this sponge over here, and um, this is kind of like, I don't know, old school. So we, we would be sanding in a corner like this, and I noticed that it would let get little um, pieces of the grain, the grit down in these corners. If you didn't blow it out completely, that's gonna get um, locked in there. Right. The paint's gonna get built up around it. So that ends up becoming a problem when you're trying to get that ultra fine finish. So it sounds like the Echo Diamond completely eliminates that. So right. Is the Echo Diamond, um, could I wet that sponge? Yes, yes. You can run, you can run any sponge wet. Right. You know, um, of course, there's different chemicals that you can that it, that it will react with, mm -hmm. but uh, for the most part, you can run it with. So, um, if it got like um, extremely dirty, you wanted to be clean. Can I take soap and water and clean it? You can wash it, but I don't recommend using soap. It, you never know what's in the soap and what chemical can react. And sometimes, if you're especially if you're sanding on white cabinets, you don't want to transfer the color onto the cabinet. So I would recommend just using water on it. Yeah, and if you use any, any type of chemical, any type of soaps, you could, if you didn't get it all out of that, you could transfer it and really work it into your finish yep. that you're recoating. You could cause fisheye contamination. That could be, become a big problem too. But washable, reusable um, with just water, yep. and you're good to go. This is uh, just a stained and lacquered door. Just pull off of somebody's house, and we're, how do we start? Well, this is a pretty detailed uh, profile door. So we're gonna need a half inch because we need to be able to drop in and get some of these profiles without flat spotting, right? But we still have a lot of flat surface and we don't wanna use a half inch on the flat surface. So I would pull in a 10 millimeter. And then the last thing is, is we because it is so detailed, there will be some areas where we will need to do some hand sanding. And right. so the last thing I would pull in is the economic sponge. And so um, for my audience, there's, a lot of different, um, within the sponge, different grits you can use. So um, you've got, I can see there's fine, very fine and super fine. And um, there's other ones, but um, and maybe like medium and stuff like that. What grits would you use to sand this door? Well, the, the thing that we have to remember is that we're gonna, the door's gonna be really good and cleaned, right? And that the, what we want to do is we wanna take off the shiny surface. So you wanna go a little bit more aggressive in the beginning. So you may wanna go a medium fine or a fine, right? And you wanna get that gloss off of there. But we have to also remember that we're not sanding for leveling in this situation. We're sanding for the next coat to adhere, right? right? So we're just looking to put a scratch. So we don't have to get 
into our conventional abrasives and really get down into the wood. Because the more you get down into the wood, the more you're going to show in your, right. your finish. So what I would go with is I would go either with, like I said, a medium fine mm -hmm. and then or a fine. Okay. That would give us a good scratch. So medium fine or fine. And I know um, I get this question all the time, you know, from customers and they're saying, do I need to sand this down to bare wood before I paint it? Absolutely not. Okay. And um, so all we're trying to do is just create a mechanical scratch um, and a good scratch with our abrasive. So our top coat can bite to that, right? Right, okay. right. And I know like if you do, because this is gonna happen, you're gonna start sanding and you are gonna, what we call burn through the finish all the way to the wood, that's definitely okay. We're not gonna try to strip the whole entire thing to wood. If you do burn through the wood on some areas, we're just gonna prime those before we actually top coat them um, or you're gonna be priming the whole door itself. And a lot of it, this is getting into coatings and, um, and what coatings you're using and stuff. But typically if you're getting into bare wood, it's gonna be need, uh, you're gonna need to prime those areas specifically. So um, can we just see what it looks like? You're gonna start sanding this. Um, what are you gonna start with first? You pulled out a 10 millimeter sponge. Right. Um, so this is a uh, 10 millimeter closed sponge, a little bit denser. Right, it's a closed cell. And the reason I use 10 millimeter and, and the five millimeter in this instance would be fine. Okay. You could use a five millimeter, but you want it to either be the five or 10 because you want the de dense, denser uh, foam properties, the closed cell foam. And the reason being is because you want it to actually grip. You don't want that deep recession of the grain, right? right? So you can see the amount of powder that this leaves. And that's what we're looking for, was that all we wanna do is we just wanna take off that clear coat, right. right? And give it a nice scratch. That'll actually fill in really nice. So we didn't we didn't like cut all the way through the clear coat, we just kind of scratched the top of right. it. Right. So if you start over sanding, um, you're gonna start cutting through that into right. the wood and we don't need to do that. Right, and you're also gonna, you know, you're gonna, you don't wanna, the least amount you cut through on these edges and, and into your, your stain, the better it is because that's gonna show up in your paint. Right, and so you started off with the um, 10 millimeter uh, closed cell sponge on your flat surfaces, then you'll switch over to a different sponge now? Yeah, I'll go in with the, the half inch sponge and the reason being is because I do have a lot of pillow topping in here. I got a lot of uh, profile that'll need to be sanded. Mm -hmm. So I can turn this in. That's the nice thing about the three by four. Again, I've talked about it before. I always offset a little bit. Yeah, I okay. do that a lot. And you can see a little bit of cut through, mm -hmm. even with the half inch, and that's okay. Yeah. You know, we're not we're not completely cutting it down. Yeah, we I mean we see that all the time. It's not very um, uncommon at all. It's typically always going to cut through just a little bit, and that's where you know, depending on what top coat you're going to be using, some top coats require a primer and then a multiple top coats. Um, some of the uh, one and two K polys we're using, they're self seal products, and they'll seal that bare wood, you know, on your first coat, and so they're a little bit simpler and easier to use. I know you got an academic diamond sponge, would you use that at any point in time on this this door? Yeah, I, the, the edges are something that I usually go back to hand sanding on. And the reason I do, you can use the, the sander. I'm not saying you can't, but for me, I get a little bit better control by grabbing the door and I can actually get all the way up to this right. without changing that. So I like to hand sand my edges all the way around. Um, and then I usually check too, after I sand all of this, to see, do I did I miss anything? Did I miss anything in here that I might need to hit? You know, if I maybe the sander skipped over right here, and I might might need to get in here. The nice thing about the hand sanding sponge is it gives me that ability because it's very flexible, right? right. So I can turn it any way I want and get in. Right and sand. It didn't take you very long to do this at all. So that's scratched up good enough to begin our coating process. Absolutely. Yeah. I know like for me, uh, I'm trying to do this extremely fast and because the faster I do it, um, the more efficient I'm going to be. Uh, I guess it comes down to money. I'm going to make more money the faster I am. I typically um, will have my half inch sponge. I'll do my 
edges with my mechanical sander half inch is that wrong to do or no. something okay no i just prefer i feel like i get a better sand and i've yeah. got more control on the edges yeah. with the hand sponge yeah and i i take like i um i always have Echidina sponges. I have a couple other your guys' sponges use. We always keep them on the job site too. I usually have an inspection table with an inspection light. Um, I saw you adjusted the sponge. I like to adjust the sponge a lot of times like this to get it Absolutely. down to the corners. I could, that's okay to yeah. do too. Yeah. Okay, nothing wrong with that. No. So I believe we're like ready to uh, dust and recoat, uh, right? Right. Okay. And so um, we are going to recoat now. I'm going to spray on whatever type of top coat it is. I like using uh, 2K polys, um, so like catalyzed polyurethane. I'm going to spray it on um, first coat. An hour later, I'm going to sand in between coats. What would I sand with in between coats? Generally, most people will step up a grid, okay. right? I kind of go between sometimes I'll step up. It depends on the thickness of your, your primer also, right. like on, on your coating, what what how thick of a um, layer you lay down. If you're th laying it on very thick, then I'm gonna stay with the same grit. Right. But if it's a it's a if it's a thinner layer, then I might step up and go, you know, very fine here okay. on primer. Um, on the flat surface, same thing. I'm gonna go very fine. I'm always gonna match these two because I want that scratch to match. Right. And then on the Echo Diamond, I'll stop, step up to the 180. Okay, so um, that's a really good point you just brought up. So we have a half inch sponge, we have a 10 millimeter of a sponge. You're saying you definitely you want to match. So if I'm using very fine on one, I wanna use very fine on the other. Yes. So that, that's good to know because sometimes I haven't paid attention to that as much, so. Um, um, and because you said the scratch, you want the right. scratch to match. You so, want to match the scratch. To match the scratch or scratch to match. You need to match the scratch and that's what this is all about. So we're going to be talking about how to get the perfect finish on a painted cabinet door. There can be some difference when it comes to a stained and lacquered door versus a painted door. We've got our three by four sander here. This is the best sander you'll ever use when it comes to painting cabinets. And then all the abrasives that go along with it can be a little bit confusing, but Sherry's gonna break it down and make it very simple. So we have a lot of stuff we have interface pads, we have pad savers. Um, I don't see one around here, but we've got um, film tech, we've got um, Echo Storm, we've got closed cell sponges, open cell sponges, we've got Echidima sponges. Uh, Sherry, can you break this down, how we would sand this door and make it simple and easy to do for our viewers? Sure, so this is basically a shaker door with a profile inside. So with the shaker door, that's perfect for the three by four because that means I can get in corner to corner, right? Mm, right. The fastest way that I've found to be able to do this is with the 10 millimeter, right? The 10 millimeter is nice because it keeps me up above the wood. If I bump the sander into right. the wood, I don't do any damage versus the five millimeter. And this, the five millimeter is, is fine on flats, but this is just a better situation for right. the 10 mil. But what we want to do is we want to sand the 10 mil. And with a painted door, you want to start with a, a fine, right? We want to start around a 220 grit, 180 to 220 grit scratch. And the reason being is a factory cabinet usually has a clear coat on over the, the paint. Right. So we're going to, again, we need to take that back down. We need to get that shiny surface look off of it. And we need to put a scratch in it so right. that our next coat will adhere. So with this one, I'm going to go with the 10 millimeter fine. I can do both the center panel and the rails and stalls with this, right? Right. So I'll just sand this real quick. So I saw um, you do like kind of a specific pattern. You went around the square and you went side to side and worked your way up. I mean. Is that best to do? Can I just randomly sand around? You, or? you can randomly sand around. The reason I do what I do is because I want to follow that pattern because I want to make sure I don't miss a spot, right? So okay. if I follow that pattern, I know I'm going to hit that spot. Um, you know, and the, and it's same thing with the rails and styles. And when we're sanding on, on raw wood, when we're in a factory, um, you know, we are looking to take out cross grain. And so it, it's trained into my mind now to make that pass around the racetrack. So, so we call it, we'll go around the racetrack a couple of times right. and concentrate on the, the cross grain, right? So I kind of follow that when I'm doing in the finish room. When I'm sanding in the finish room, I just keep that in mind. Right. Now, this could be done 
we could break out the half inch, right? right? We could take it with the sander and break out the half inch. For me, again, there's some things that I want to hand sand and I just want to be able to do this real fast, right? Mm -hmm. And I can do that just that fast. It doesn't have to be an aggressive uh, scratch. It just has to be enough for the next coat to hear. And so I just do the same thing here. I just do the same thing all the way around. So, sorry, but can I put this uh, on my silence? Perfect time. I guess like, I always thought you had to do this, but you don't have no. to do that. So, cause um, I guess my understanding is, all you're doing is just putting a scratch on there for your coating to bite to, right? We're not right. taking off finish. Right, and, right. and that's a big, a big misconception is people want to level. And right. this, is not, this is not the area where we level. We right. level prior to finish. We're leveling when it's bare wood. Right. Yep. So um, good information. So is this door ready to go now? It's ready to go. It's ready to go. So on the back side of this, because um, we, we always paint the fronts and backs to the doors, there's no like contoured profile. This is really like a, a shaker style door now. It's basically the same as the opposite side. Right. Okay. Right. And you said- um, The only you, difference is, is that because you, you're missing that profile, right? right? So you're just gonna come in with this here. So you do need to hit that side. You then. do need to hit that because okay. if you don't, you'll actually be able to feel a, a rougher surface. There. Okay, a lot of times, I don't even know what people are talking about when I'm learning something new. You said rails and styles. Right. And what's a rail and what's a stop? Rails, styles. Yep, so here's your rail, here's your style. Right. I mean, when I heard that term the first time, I'm like, what the heck are you talking about? And so um, I, I like to just point that stuff out. So if you didn't know, now you know what we're talking about when it comes to rails and styles. So I also wanted to just ask like one question. You you said um, something about orbiting and stuff. Is this, is this an orbiting sander? It is, is an it? orbiting sander, but it's what we call a direct drive. So it is orbiting in a circle. It is not. It doesn't have that random pattern. Okay. In the past, square sanders were vibrating sanders. So what would happen is you'd put them in and they were just moving up and down, right? Okay. And so you would get a very uneven scratch. With the orbital sander, we actually do get a very uniform scratch. It's a much better scratch. Okay, and it's not a random orbit sander, no. right? Okay. No. And one other question I wanna ask you, this does have a plus and a minus, so you can adjust the speed of the sander, um, and then it has a minus in the middle, but that's the on off button. Do you ever mess around with I do. the- I do, I do. Sometimes I do mess around, and depending on what we're sanding. So if we're, um, we were at a cabinet shop a couple weeks ago, and we got into a situation where we needed to be a little less aggressive on MDF or HDF doors, right? And so we actually turn the speed down a little bit on a pneumatic sander because it's right. variable, variable speed. Same thing with this, we can turn it down a little bit and it gives us a nice even surface. Right. The only time I really turn it down is when I'm running on HDF or MDF because right. uh, it's you, I need that to be burnished. Cause I know it's like, I always run it at, at full speed, but there was one time I kind of, I was messing around and experimenting with it. And when I started to turn it down, I started to see swirls. Is that That's typical? Normal. That's okay. typical. And the, the one thing with the three by four, and if you go back to some of our other videos, we talked about that non-woven, the Unilon pad that will take out swirls. These sanders are, because they are a direct drive, they are indicative of swirls. So it's really, with the sponge, it is a lot less if you're using the right sponge on the right substrate. And that's the big thing is that if you don't, if you use a half inch, you're probably gonna get the swirls, but the 10 millimeter and five millimeter, you shouldn't see it much in the finish. Yeah, and I don't, if you do see swirls now before you refinish it, I know there's a time I was painting some white doors, I could see the swirls in the right light. And I'm like, oh, the paint's just gonna fill it right in. Don't think that, don't go down that path because it's not gonna fill it in. You will see the swirls. You gotta get the swirls out before you recode it. So there you have, we've got the scenario how to properly sand a painted door. So Sherry, would you just walk us through um, sanding a raw wood door and talk about why you would use the five inch sander and not the three by four? Yeah, sure. So with a raw wood door, generally when it comes out of the white, it's wide belt sanded, right? So as it goes through, you've got this running, the grain running with the sander, but then this grain is running against the sander. So right. we get what we call cross grain, right? We also, you can see on here, you've got some drag marks. So we need to take those out. When they sell doors, when the door, a door shop either builds it or sell, or they buy it out, 
you know, from a, a door supply company, they let these guys set up. When wood sits up, it closes. So it's not going to accept stain the way it would or paint the way it would if it was recently sanded. So we need to open right. the wood back up, and that's why we, we sand it. So why do I use a five inch? Well, the five inch gives me a little bit more torque and it's also got that random pattern. This guy, like I told you in a previous video, has a tendency to leave swirl marks because it's a direct drive. I want to get that random pattern. And the idea is to do as little sanding on raw wood as possible. So the right. more you sand on raw wood, the more likely you are to get swirls. Right. So what, what I would do is generally, most wide belt sanders, they're finishing out at about 180 or 220, right? So we don't ever want to go too far back. You can go 150, but I choose to go to 180 most right. of the time. So I've got a 180 film tech, and I choose film tech again because I like the finish of the film tech. Okay. Right. So you're not going to be using a um, half inch sponge, open cell sponge, or um, 10 millimeter or five millimeter sponge on this? No, and the right. reason being is that when you put a sponge on raw wood, it tends to polish. And if you polish, you're gonna get pooling and you're gonna get, you're gonna have issues with your finish. Okay, pooling, just um, if you don't know what pooling is, that's the, your finish and stuff, you're gonna be straight on a seal coat. It's not gonna be absorbing into the wood. Right. And it's gonna pool on top of the wood. Right. Okay. And you'll also get like some uneven staining because right. the wood will be polished. It won't absorb the stain. Okay, cool. All right. So what I want to concentrate on, and we talked about going around the racetrack, is on the cross grain. Generally, and I haven't said this before, but we always start on stop off. You saw me go around twice, and the reason I do that is because I want to hit the rails, you know, the, the, the rails at least twice, but the my, most of my work is going to be right here on the stalls to get that cross grain out. The center panel, again, we want to go around. I use that pattern simply because I want to make sure I don't miss anything. Right. Would you like these drag marks right here that are still showing up, what would you do to get those out? You're going to have to do some more sanding. Okay, so you'd use the same sander? Right. Same sander, just okay. do a little bit more sanding. Um, I try to, when, when I'm doing a demo, I try not to, and unfortunately we have those in place and right. we can work on those. Uh, but I try to show you what the norm is and, right. and doing that. The other profile sand in this area is it's delicate. So a, a, a conventional abrasive is going to cut down. It's going to flat spot. So we can't take either this guy or this guy into this area, right? right. Because we're going to change that profile. We're going to cause some issues. You've got a, a ton of profile in here. So this is what, another area where you got to go back and hand right. sand. Um, and, and again, I go to the Echo Diamond. Um, you've got to get, you've got some pretty intricate de detail in here. I want to get in there and I want to just rough it up and make sure that if I've got any mill marks that I get them out, right? So same thing that we do all the way around. And again, we're just looking to make sure we get all our mill marks. You're gonna to wanna to blow this out before you lay down any primer. But it's, most of these doors are pre-sanded on the, you know, they're sanded pre-assembly. So these are, this is a five piece door. So this center panel is usually sand, all of this is, is already sanded, right. right? So all we're doing is just opening back up with the sponge. So that's something I didn't know. So um, they are coming pretty sanded. This is sanded, then it's all assembled. So you don't have to do a lot of sanding. Right. So the sanding is really just opening it up. So right. um, for those that um, may be the first time they've heard this term open, can you just explain a little bit of detail what open means, what that refers to. Well, it's like I said, the wood, when it sits for any period of time, it's porous, wood's porous, so it starts right. to close, right? It's gonna close up, the grain's gonna seal up on itself, right. and it's not going to absorb stain like we want it to. So it doesn't take a very big sand. Right. You don't have to go into detail, you're not looking, and when we talk about, you know, maybe some cross grain, that may have already been sanded out. Then right. it's just going around the racetrack right. twice. Right. So, and again, like I said, this is going to be pre-sanded prior to assembly. So you're just going to really just go over it. Let's get it open up. Let's allow that right. wood to be ready for stain and let it absorb it. So that's uh, good information to know. So now this thing is ready to blow off and ready to be stained. 
and ready to go. Yeah, I'll, I would need to hit just the edges the again. Edges, I didn't. Yeah, right. I didn't get these. Just simply. We so were you do your with. edges with your um, same yeah. thing, the Echidiamond yeah. sponge. Yeah. And um, so you would use the Echidiamonds because there are you guys sell the one inch like black sponges. The I think blocks. The, yeah, the blocks are one called blocks. uni sponges. I think uni sponges. Uni sponge. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't use that. You would use the Echidiamond. I use the Echidiamond. I personally, and this is a personal preference, I prefer the half inch, and the reason being is because it is so conformable in my hand. I can do, you know, I do this all the time, and when I when I tell people that is because. I can get in there and I can use as much pressure or as little pressure as right. I need. In my understanding too, this is um, a rubber sponge right here. This outside is rubber. So if you're sanding like your corners and edges, it's not going to tear. No, okay. will not tear. So. And then you also, you mentioned in the beginning, um, you don't like to use, uh, um, I think it was conventional um, abrasives or you do use conventional abrasives on this you do you do use conventional and so and for those that um may not understand what the term conventional is so conventional abrasives are typically your film tech and echo storm right right um and so these are not conventional right abrasives. anytime okay. you apply um like a sponge any type of sponge is not all your conventional abrasives are going to be belts paper discs cloth right. disc um film disc you know uh, sheets Anything right. that actually has grain that stands prominent. Right. We're going to be talking about uh, th uh, three sanders that Unita sells, and we also sell on Paint Life Supply Co. Uh, my favorite sander, the 3x4. Um, I use the 5 inch sander, and I even use a 6 inch sander when you would actually use these sanders. And I want, you know, Sherry, you to just talk a little bit about the inner workings of the sanders, what makes them so special and um, unique. So we'll just start off and give us some information about them. Great. Thanks, Chris. So. Basically, these sanders are all brushless sanders. And what that means is in the past, the electric sanders had brushes in them, right? right? And so as they run, the brushes are actually in here and they actually start to wear down and that's actually what makes the sander stop running. Now we've got going on to a brushless sander, right? So there's no right. brushes in here. And that means you, you the life of the sander is much longer. So the other positive to these sanders are they're DC driven. And that happens in the handle. There's an inverter in the handle that switches it from AC to DC that allows you to be able to plug it into a AC plug, right? right? So it gives you a much longer light. There's three different sizes like you talked about. We got the three by four, the five inch, and the six inch. The five inch, well, let's go back to the three by four first. The three by four I use mostly in the finish room. That's where I see the biggest advantage for the three by four because I'm using it with the sponges and it gives me the longer life with the sponges and it allows me to get in corner to corner. I'm not as concerned with swirls because I am using the sponges, it's less li likely to give me swirls. If I'm sanding on raw wood, I'm gonna go either with my five inch or my six inch. Again, it depends on what I'm doing. If I'm building cabinets, if I'm in a cabinet shop, I'm gonna probably use my five inch. And the reason being, it's a little bit, if you've got two different swaths, you got either a 3 16 swath or you got a 3 32nd swath. And the 316th is a little bit more aggressive. The 332nd is our finishing sander, right? right? So I'm gonna use the five inch in, in a cabinet situation. If I'm finishing a large table or if someone would call you about solid surface, I'm gonna go to a six inch. And the reason I'm gonna use a six inch is because it's a much bigger footprint. You can see the difference in the footprint just by putting them, the three of them together. This is a small footprint. It's going to call, cover a small area. This is going to cover a little bit bigger area because we've got that random pattern, bigger uh, surface. And then, of course, the six inches even bigger. So if you're doing a conference table or something to that effect, you want to use the six inch because we can get a lot more coverage and it can go through it much quicker. And um, I know all of them, they, they're variable speed. Right. Okay, and you can adjust them. There's a plus and a minus, and they're simple to adjust. Um, are they um, random orbit or direct drive uh, sanders? The 3x4 is a direct drive, so that means it's orbiting, but it's orbiting in a, in a circle. Okay. No random pattern. Okay. These two are random orbitals. The 5-inch and the 6-inch are random orbitals, so you have a much wider swath, and you have that that rotation and that random pattern. All right. Um, so you gave us some good scenarios where these would be used. I'll let you know, um, my audience, what I use each of them for, because I have all three of them. I use my three by four. I do cabinet refinishing. I use my three by four for doing my cabinet refinishing. And typically I'm sticking with the three by four 
all of it. I also use 3x4 We Repaint Interior Trim. So I'm using it to repaint interior trim hooked to my sander so I'm not creating dust. Uh, I do refinish decks. So I use my five inch when I'm refinishing decks, exterior um, homes. So it's a little bit bigger. It's a little bit faster uh, doing a deck than a little three by four. I also do Venetian plaster. I use the six inch to polish Venetian plaster. I don't do it very often, but that's what I use the six inch for because we're typically large walls of Venetian plaster and I polish it and it works excellent for Venetian plaster. So there's um, some tips and tricks, you know, um, or some information about the sanders. Now, all three of them will hook up to uh, their sanding system, Unita sanding system, correct? Yes, all three of them will come with a, you can add, if you get the sander and it doesn't have the vacuum port, you decide to add the vacuum later. It's a very easy fix. It's just changing out the shroud, adding the vacuum port, and you're ready to roll. So you can take, um, if you have one that you purchased that has the vacuum port on it, you can take and eliminate it? Yes. And if you bought one without a vacuum port, you can add it? Yes. So that's um, really good to know. So if you made a mistake buying one or the other, you can completely change it or convert it in a very simply and easily. So there's the three sanders. Um, I love them. I use them all the time um, by Unita. Um, they're called the Ekasan. If you have any questions or comments about these sanders, how they're used um, if you want to adapt them to different vacuums or whatever I use it with Unita's vacuum system because it's absolutely amazing almost vacuums up a hundred percent of the dust um, but if you got any questions or comments about it leave it in the comment section below we would love to answer your questions as soon as we can get to them down in the comment section below thank you for being right here on paint live tv we appreciate it and we'll see you on our next video